<clears throat> power and peace. Power and peace, black family. Power and peace. This is your brother Patrick Lumumba with the Black Liberation Movement podcast, second edition. We back up and operating Thursday nights at seven o'clock. Ready to bring it to you as profound as we can bring it. So. We want to get started tonight. We don't want to waste a lot of time tonight getting started. <clears throat> we want to make sure that we uh, we want to acknowledge um, Baba Kamal Kareem, who's supposed to be on with us tonight again, who is the lead counsel of the Black Liberation Movement. Uh, and uh, also, there he is, Brother Jeffrey Ryan Futrell. Uh, also. You know, I hope that brother be on tonight. I was actually calling you, Brother Jeffrey Ryan, to see if you wanted to be a part of this show tonight. You have been very profound in the last two uh, pods that we put on for the last two conversations that we've had. You've been very uh, conducive in that conversation and building that conversation. And we're looking for people to help us build this conversation. Peace and power. There he is, Dr. Jeffrey Ryan. Dr. Jeff Ryan, we want to know we're going to be on here for about an hour, maybe a little bit more than an hour. Uh, if you uh, want to come on the show tonight, we would be glad to have you on the show tonight. Most definitely, my powerful brother and comrade in the fight for the liberation of our people. Well, we make no bones about it. We leave no uh, stone unturned, as they say. We leave no stone unturned when it comes to the liberation of our people. We felt like it was a uh, necessity. It was imperative that we come back and begin to have these conversations with our people and use social media for more than uh, extending birthday gifts and uh, well wishes for your birthday and uh, everybody uh, praying for everybody for everything that happened to them in their life. We gotta do some things as a community, black people. We gotta do some things as a community. So, uh, Brother Jeffrey Ryan, I don't know uh, if your apparatus uh, can uh, access, let me see here. Trying to see if we can get Brother Jeffrey Ryan on tonight. But if it's, if it's a, a accessible way for us to do that, we're gonna make sure that we get it on, get get it done, brother. We like to see you tonight, and we like to hear uh, from you tonight. We got a very, very, very uh, interesting topic tonight. Very interesting topic tonight, and what we want to be talking about because we don't just pop on here, start talking about stuff. You know, we 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 look at things that's going on, and not only that, please check your messenger. Check your message, Bob. Peace and power. Power and peace. Power and peace, uh, Brother Eric. I'm glad you're on tonight, too, Brother Eric Lowes. I'm glad you're on tonight. We had a very critical conversation last night uh, with the BYLC and the group of young black power builders, young black power builders, builders in the community uh, that we organize under the banner of the Generational Vanguard. We appreciate them, brothers, and we most definitely will be uh building that aspect of the black liberation movement we're serious about these people we're very serious about what it what it is we're doing we passing the concept on to the pragmatic practical application of what it is that we're talking about look very closely at that emblem on my hat look very closely at that emblem on my hat that's how serious we are about what it is that we're doing we uh looking to politicize the state of Mississippi and we're looking to make strong that which so many think is weak and it's a process to doing that you just don't talk this into existence it's a process to doing what it is that we have set out to do so tonight <clears throat> we want to talk about brother Jeff Ryan check your check your messenger uh, Brother Jeffrey Ryan, check your messenger. I think we sent you the uh, the link so that we can bring you on tonight as a guest on the show. So check your link. Yeah. 
But let me get a proper greetings to everybody that's on tonight. I appreciate you being on. I'm glad just to be on again and being relevant again. Um, the proper greetings, uh, power and peace, uh, hotel, um, free the land, Isalamu alaikum. Uh, I'll just simply hello. You know how you doing today? How are the black family today? How's the black family today? Y'all talk back to me. How you doing, uh, Sister Monique Watson? How you doing today? Appreciate you for coming on today, representing that powerful, powerful street organization, Yaga, Youth Against Gang Activity. Powerful street organization and declaration that we have here in Mississippi, Yaga, Youth Against Gang Activity. Think about that. We reversing, we reversing the syndrome. We're gonna turn this thing around in Mississippi. And I got my brother Frank McCollin, a uh, longtime supporter and very strong advocate of the Black Liberation Movement. Appreciate that brother for being on as well. So we're gonna push on tonight. I want to introduce our topic <clears throat> tonight. And I want y'all to think long and hard about this topic as we begin to have this conversation tonight. The topic of tonight's broadcast is power brokering in the black community. What is the quality of black life? Power brokering in the black community. And what is the quality of black life? Think about that. We have a black community that composed of a lot of components. Um, <clears throat> These components are um, multifaceted components that we have that make up our community. You know, we begin to name those components that's making up our community. We looking at uh, areas of human activity. We looking at areas of what Francis Church Wilson and Dr. Neely Fuller call the areas of human activity, battle, and concern. So we begin to look at education. Okay, we begin to look at economics, entertainment, labor, law, sex, uh, religion, so on and so forth. We begin to look at the components that build life. And when we specifically look into the black community, that's what I want us to do tonight. I want us to specifically look at the black community because when we're talking about these areas of battle, we have to break them down and see how these areas are doing in the black community. When we're talking about education, when we're talking about economics, let's just, and, 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 and religion. Let's look at those three things right there. Let's just look at those three areas. I think Dr. Jeff Ryan, you had it right, uh, brother. I seen you, you backstage, we have you backstage, but uh, we're gonna bring you on uh, pretty soon, but you backstage now. And you had it right. Yeah, because I could see you for a, a moment there. But it says your device is not connected right now. So whatever you were doing, it was right. Okay. But <clears throat> the areas of battle and activity and concern in the Black community is so something that we should be looking at. We should uh, take a very concerned look at education. We should be taking a very concerned look at economics in the black community and we should be taking a very very uh concerned look at religion in our community and the role that they have played in our community you know and who has the power in our community we begin to hash this conversation out all across mississippi with mississippi on the move we are beginning to hash out this conversation all across the state of Mississippi. Uh, we have matriculated and uh, uh, descended on four historically black townships in Mississippi, uh, starting out with Holly Springs, Mississippi. We matriculated on to Indianola, Mississippi. And we left there and we headed to Oklahoma, Mississippi. And we left there and we hit the mighty town last week of Clarksdale, Mississippi. And so from there, we'll be headed to Natchez, Mississippi. 
and from there, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, for Juneteenth weekend. So if you all can see, we are beginning to leave an imprint on the state of Mississippi. And it is of our understanding and what we feel uh, is something imperative that we do, that we make a strong and pro pronounced uh, uh, showing to the world that we can politicize ourselves, we can organize ourselves in a manner that's effective to the quality of Black life in every area of activity, battle, and concern. We want to thank our Ministries of Wellness for being on tonight. Mi uh, Ministries uh, Miller Renee, very important and integral part of what it is that we do. You know, we added, you know, an uh, area of battle to the nine areas of battle. So we actually claimed 10 areas of battle and that 10th area was health. Health is an area of battle that we have to contend with in the black community. So we had to have a Ministries of Wellness that's on her grind every day you know she has a uh a youtube that we should be su subscribing to uh miller's moments and uh she's doing uh very effective workouts she has a very effective workout regimen and she has a very effective uh just uh wellness uh conversation for you it ain't just a workout physically it's a mental uh experience as well with M miller and what it is that she's doing with Miller's moment and what it is that she do for the Black Liberation Movement and what it is that we are doing for our people. And we have Brother Jahi Ashe, who is the captain of the BYLC, which is another component of the Black Liberation Movement. The BYLC is the Black Youth Leadership Coalition. See, we serious about this. We got young people that's serious about this. No, they don't get a lot of fanfare on social media because we ain't trending. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to begin to trend this. So share, share, share. Get some black power on your page. Share this. You know, that's one of my biggest pet. Well, it ain't even a pet peeve. It's a, it's a problem for me. Pet peeve ain't a strong enough word. It's a problem for me that we got a problem with black power. We got a problem with black power. But we suffer from white power and all that has uh, come with that. So tonight we want to talk about power brokering in the black community. What is the quality of black life? That's what we want to talk about tonight. Thank y'all for chiming in tonight. It's going to be a very, very, very robust conversation. We're going to be as effective as possible. I see our lead counsel, Bob Kamal Kareem, has come. He's backstage. Hey, listen, I got some heavy hitters backstage. I got some heavy hitters backstage. Dr. Jeffrey Ryan Futrell is backstage and Baba General Kamal Kareem Jr. is backstage tonight. So without further ado, we're going to bring these brothers on. I think we can bring them on simultaneously. These are elders to me. Yeah. Yeah, there they go. I see you, Baba Kamal. How you doing today? Yeah. All right, sir. How are you? Can you hear me good? Yes, sir. We can hear you good. Good to hear you. And we see Dr. Jeffrey Ryan Future having him a bite. All right, sir. How are you? You ain't backstage no more, Doc. You, 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 you front and center. And, and you got some background noise. Hey, good Jeff morning. Ryan. Good afternoon. All right, sir. How are you? You ain't backstage no more. I got you. I got you. You got, you. You got, you. You got me? Trying to cut okay. it out now. All right. Got you. We thank you for that. Baba Kamal Kareem, this is Brother Dr. Jeffrey Ryan Futrell of Young Men University in Memphis, a strong soldier that had been doing the work and doing his due diligence in the Memphis community. But he had some roots in Mississippi as well. So we Pleasure have some Mississippi you. ties here. Yes, sir. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah. All right. All right. So, <clears throat> like I said, our topic tonight is power brokering in the black community. Uh, uh, Baba, Baba Kamal. 
And yes, sir. what is the quality of black life? So we want to kind of elaborate on that. You know, kind of let people know what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about power brokering in the black community and understanding the quality of black life and how do we begin to uh, put the components together uh, to deal with each one of those aspects. I kind of merged them together. Each one of them could have been two shows. It could have been two shows out of it, but I wanted to merge it together. The power brokering aspect, you know, the ho- the people who hold in the seats of power in the black community, you know, what we should be looking at and what we should be looking for, you know, out of those seats of power, you know, as we begin to rise up as the masses of black people and demand more, you know, from those seats of power, whether that be the pulpit, our downtown city hall, uh, the black professional class, our black business people, whatever it may be. How do we begin to broker the power in the black community for the best interest of the masses of our people in the black community? I want both of you all to, uh, you know, expound on that. Well, well if, I, if I may, uh, you've heard me say this many times, you know, what we've been viewing as power is nothing but contaminated consensus reality in terms of uh, our day-to-day life, the survival of our community, uh, because we, we, we're we we're basing our reality on uh, oppressors' thought pattern. And, you know, and if I, if I may, when we start talking about brokering power, first of all, one of the reasons why we are trying to consolidate or, or revitalize Black power is uh, what's called therapeutic pluralism. See, and, and what that means is it means bringing people together under the reason who, what, and where, and why in a cultural circle. And it, it died down with the um, from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, it, it waned because uh, a capitalistic interest was buying off uh, the consolidation of what we are revitalizing now. Uh, either it was done through uh, law enforcement by force, or uh, certain things were offered to certain people in leadership positions to go somewhere sit down and be quiet uh, mm-hmm. and also the implementation of the policy as we talked about last night uh through the nixon administration uh on up till now which is called benign neglect so when we actually talk about power uh we actually we're in a state of crisis and technically we really don't have any hmm. we have to take this power uh, you know, uh, we have some small, considerable gains that is acceptable to white establishment. But in terms of the brokerage of power, that ended with uh, that field order of the 40 acres in the mule when President Andrew Jackson took all of it back and the coastline of the Carolinas when that was given uh, to our people uh, uh after slavery during reinstruction and all that was taken away because that would have been uh, uh, an economic gain to sustain community and society and to have autonomy. But that was that was taken away and taken back. Not to add the 185,000 black union soldiers that fought to have uh, freedom, black power, but uh, still suffered Jim Crow and didn't have the right to vote. Mm. Hmm. Okay. 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 Thank you for that, uh, Baba Kamal. All right. You want to chime in on the power brokering in the black community, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Wright? Could you hear me, Dr. Wright? Dr. Dr. Futrell? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know where the background noise coming from, but it may be a problem. Okay. All right. Well, can you hear me? Is that better? Yeah. The background noise is gone. I'm trying to make sure you hear me on time. It seems like it might be a little delayed. Can you hear me? 
I'm hearing Buzz Bunny. Well, I can hear you, but it's not really that clear. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, <clears throat> I think what we may need to do, I don't I don't know, uh, you know, this is a new platform for us with the StreamYard, and I'm trying to, you know, navigate it the best we can. I don't know whether it's a problem that we have two people simultaneously uh, on the screen, but I, well, Let me try something, brother. Hang on. Okay. So we want to be transparent. See. This is going to work. Can you hear me now? I can hear nope. you well. Yeah, very now well. I can't hear you. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. So, so, so. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. We can hear you well. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I can't hear you, though. But you can't hear us. Okay. All right. Bob, do you have two devices on? No. Bob, if you trail. Okay. Well, what, what we can do. What I can do is just mute him while he's not speaking. Right. Well, just go ahead on and mute him. We'll get back. We'll come back to him once we get that straightened you know, out with his audio. While he's not speaking. Well, right. well, just go ahead on and mute him. We'll get back. We'll come back to him. Once take him, we take him back. You know. Right. Okay. All right. Bob Kamal, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Well, we're going to fix that. You know, that was our first chance uh, our, uh, attempt at doing that. So, uh, we got to work the logistics out on, on that. So we're going to continue the conversation. But uh, I like what you said about, you know, uh, concerning, you know, and giving that historical context about, yeah. you know, the power broker in the, in, in the community. And I, I, I want to kind of, you know, think, you know, from that historical content, we want to uh, warp it to today, you know, and what we're dealing with, you know, yeah. today. In the black yeah country. but but if i may say <clears throat> if you don't under it, it, see if we don't learn the uh dynamic of how we were shaped uh we won't understand the current shape that we're in see no doubt because a lot of these things were done by the government purposely and it's still a continuum you know and, and what i mean by that is take take for instance uh with the great migration of seven million uh african americans coming from the south going up north well uh in order to create the ghetto the government spent billions of dollars purposely putting us in certain sections uh deliberately causing poverty and deliberately putting us locating us where uh we're even located in uh, uh cities and metropolises now because they wanted to take away that idea of self-determination uh housing and urban development is on record of uh putting billions of dollars in highways going over these communities uh factories being built by these communities which in turn caused what we call the ghetto this is what we call the ghetto now but we were mm -hmm. deliberately disenfranchised in our migration and so uh, you know, and, and the reason why I'm saying this is because it's all in understanding power. And I, I know where you're coming from when you talk about people that have called themselves to precipitate the leadership, whether it be the pastor or the politician or so on and so forth. But none of them are going to do us any good unless we participate in the circle of culture, learn the knowledge of ourselves and learn how to better service sociologically, biologically, our people, you know. And, and so, uh, you know, and, and until then, it, it's all white disenfranchisement of us and our leadership. We're co-opted. Right. And most definitely, you're exactly right that we have to understand the historical context of it to even understand where we are today. So I guess I kind of wanted to give a clear perspective on, I was just trying to make a transition from the his, historical aspect to the now and we do go back and forth with that to show how both of them are interrelated 
And uh, as a matter of fact, I think, you know, we we, we, we get the point right now because Brother Eric Lyles is talking about the great migration, you know, and I want to get uh, into this conversation uh, so, so much into the detail of this conversation where we actually can start talking about a reverse migration. Right. Uh, Brother Eric Lyles, a reverse migration and why a reverse migration. But I also want to point out a very important brother that has come on the live stream tonight, Brother Simbo. All right. Brother Simbo is our uh, minister of history in the Black Liberation Movement. And Brother Simbo is very profound. He's in the house. He wanted us to know that he's in the house. He's listening from our YouTube uh, feed that we're trying to grow. Please subscribe to the Black Liberation Movement YouTube feed as well. We want to build these numbers up so that we can get this message out to more people. So please subscribe to the Black Liberation Movement YouTube feed where our Bible symbol is listening in. <clears throat> so yes, you were right, Bob. I appreciate that so much in the clarity and what it is that you uh, yeah. just expressed because we got to yeah. understand the historical context. Yeah, but just let me just give you an example. And what I'm leading up to is one modern day uh, uh, stereotype that we have is our own criminality and these so-called, uh, you know, gangs, violence, uh, statistics on uh, black people doing more crime than any other race, committing more murder than any other race. See, all these things have been contrived, you know, because that criminality just didn't start just when it started broadcasting over the news. That criminality has been going on systematically since the early 1900s with the portrayal of us being subhuman, with the portrayal of us being uh, 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 an animal just fit for chattel. And that stereotype has just progressed into statistics, social stratifications, you know? And so when, when you look at crime, European way of dealing with crime is this. This is an evil individual who has perpetrated something and has violated other people. Well, that's the European definition of crime. But crime is fostered by the society that's around it. Crime, mm -hmm. is, crime is, 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 is not just an individual thing. It's a societal matter. And it's fostered by the society, the circumstances that gives uh, the uh, promotion of certain behaviors. And, and so history plays into this for us because out the door, we've already been stereotyped. You've already been targeted. You've already been picked out to be picked off. And so when we start talking about power and power brokering, and when you have politicians conducting benign neglect, and that's still what's going on today from the top all the way uh, down to the lower levels of politics. You have the ignorance and the ignorance of the real situations or problems. Mm -hmm. Oh, just lock them up. Just mm -hmm. throw away the key. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, or, uh, you know, even more so to if you right now today, uh, uh, Brother Lumumba, if you was to walk beside or, or walk down the street and a white woman was to pass you, the first thing she would do <laughs> would be to grab her purse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to listen because when we talk about power, being able to make economic, social, uh, judicial, military decisions uh, in terms of how it, uh, affects your community, the security and the biological, sociological interests of the community. And we just don't see that happening and haven't seen that happening in a long time. What we have seen is we've seen an effort to include, an mm -hmm. effort to be included and to be validated and to be something other than ourselves and, and, and to continuously be disrespected in trying to do those efforts. Right. Okay. Without a doubt, Bob, again, thank you for the clarity because you always make it so clear and you always give me content uh, to uh, elaborate on and to create conversation from. And you just said something right at the end of your spiel. You said um, something that basically amounts to me as the illusion of inclusion, you right. know, where we don't really have uh, real power. Right. And power 
need to be something that's defined in the black community. We really need to define what power is. We right. not we not having a real uh we not having the real conversation as it pertains to power. You right. know, it's almost as though we want to evade, you know, what power is because the assertion of power is gonna take some real courage, you know. See if I got a vice president telling me if she's telling me that she can't work on social issues for black people oh i can't do that i, mm -hmm. I gotta work for all the people well mm -hmm. just because she has a black face that does not mean that she's a power broker mm -hmm. no doubt exactly that's a great example because we hear it all the time without with our uh diffident and cowardly black politicians when they have been elected by a consortium of black people uh, a, 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 a particular group of black people to represent them and when they get in power uh because of that black uh uh uh, uh support that black uh representation i mean that black uh elected uh block they begin to talk a very humanitarian message well you know i just can't do this for black people and when black politicians start talking like that <laughs> then we know that they are actually saying that i ain't gonna do nothing consequential for black people and see right. that's 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 kind of what i want to get at you know the emergence of that in the black community, you know, the emergence of the coon, you know, uh, in the black community, whether that coon, like I said, be in the pool pit or downtown, you know, we have to talk about the emergence of the coon, you know, in the power spots that they hold it, that actually maintaining the uh, lack of social welfare in the black community, actually being a surrogate white person uh, holding office over black people as though black people are subject you know what i'm saying so we can talk about that you know from the pulpit to uh city hall but i like once, what you're saying once you again that emergence of the coon right the emergence of the coon started way back when you had black people on the plantation trying to plot their freedom and their liberation and you had this one snitch that if they would go and tell master something then they would get some kind of reward, some kind of sorghum or some kind of sugar titty meat or something like that, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. it just has progressed on and on and on from, you know, though, or even way back even to the mother continent with Tippy Two. Tippy mm -hmm. Two was like the Steven in Bojango, or the Django. But mm -hmm. Tippy Two, uh, he, he he's gonna barter with the Portuguese to sell his own people off thinking it'll sell, uh, save himself. So- right these historical references still relate to today because we still have the same thing going on just in a more modern and technological way right right exactly you hit it on the head right there you know I, I, and i i don't even know if it's more modern it's just more right now because yeah. the, the, the egregiousness of the coon is even more detrimental now you know we we you know the identifying of the coon you know, it is it, becoming. <laughs> I mean, on the on the plantation, you know, we can point that coon out. You know right. what I'm saying? Now right. we got you know so many people that's uh, posturing themselves as as black leadership that actually uh, sell the coon. I mean, that's actually represent coon status to the fullest. You know, yeah. You have to learn there we go, meritus manumission. Yeah, that's that it. Is. That's the word that's I was the, looking that's, for. That's, that's the term, <laughs> meritus manumission, no doubt. So you know, uh, I think Bob uh, Futrell can hear us now. Just the acknowledgement of his head. I can see his head moving. So yeah. So let's bring Baba uh Jeffrey Ryan Free Trail on. And uh Baba, you can hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, well, we in good time then. Yeah, so what we talk about, uh Baba Free Trail, is power brokering in the black community. You know, we really talk about you know the selling out of the black community of black people that's in power. You know, and, uh, and and how that has historically debilitated and crippled the black community. You know what I'm saying? And we're talking about the quality of black life because I think if we can still allow coons, I'm talking about if we can still allow this as black leadership, then we cannot be looking at ourselves with a high quality of life. So what do you think about that? Well, I think you're right on point. And Elder, I, I, I agree with what you were saying as well. But... Um, when I think about power, <laughs> I always think about solidarity. And the reason we have a real 
fragmented understanding of power is because we're not together. I mean, we're not we're not strong individually. We're only going to be strong together. Mm. So the only way we're going to truly garner power, maintain it, and develop it is that we got to have solidarity. It keeps starting mm. right there. Everything we're trying to do, Memphis is an exact example that we have the numbers. We mm -hmm. have the population. But numbers don't lie, but they do convey an untruth sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because the untruth is we don't control the economics within our community. So it's almost impossible to talk about power in a realistic sense when the one element that you need to run, to have power, we, we, we hadn't refined. It's like trying to drive a car without gas. Yeah, we got the whole vehicle. But the mm -hmm. thing that fuels it, we, we don't have it, brother. And I, mm -hmm. I attribute most of this to American chattel slavery. It destroyed our ability to see the worth in each other, to seek out the worth. And not just to see it. Sometimes you have to seek it out. I think all of us have worth. But if you're mm -hmm. unwilling to seek it out, then for sure you'll never find it. It's like with our children. If you can't see their greatness, I always tell people, please get out the way. Because you're going to trip a bunch of people up who see their greatness. Because seeing their greatness is what drives us to continue on. Two things, to see their greatness and to remember they're only acting in what we we have laid down for them. Whatever our children are doing, they got it from the generations before. So we have to assume responsibility for it. And I think this is the power. To empower is power. So how do we save our children? You can't save them. You got to empower them. I don't make them drink. I make them thirsty so they'll drink on their own, of their own volition. So we have to create a thirst for the, the knowledge of history, of the ancestors, and all that we have to offer. But if we don't create the thirst for it, brother, we're just running in circles. And that's what mm -hmm. we're seeing in our community, running in circles. Because mm -hmm. we had created a thirst. And the main, the principal thirst is to know that we are doing this for the generations to come. Mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. ownership that I, I owe the generations to come. You know, I spoke to some students just a few days ago about small black businesses. I said, let me uncap this for you. There is no such thing as a small black business. That's because right. To open a business, considering all that we suffered in this country, man, that's adhering to the ancestors. There ain't nothing small about that. And when you minimize it, oh, it's just a small business, you destroy the whole fabric of what you're trying to accomplish. This is major. 400 plus years of total annihilation. And you have the audacity. Well, that audacity comes from our elders and ancestors. They gave us that. Mm -hmm. They gave us that through their suffering. So it's nothing small about it to have mm -hmm. a vision and a dream for the generations mm -hmm. to come. So I, I, I think the solidarity, and I step back with you, and the gangs are a major central piece of this because without any true supervision, they have come together in a form of solidarity that could be refined like oil and turned into gasoline to fuel other dreams because at mm -hmm. least they they formulate it together. Mm -hmm. And so we can utilize that. I, I think that we just we need to look at gangs in a whole different way with our youth because they have come together. They found mm -hmm. a common ground. We're still <laughs> looking for common ground, brothers. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we have power when we're still scrambling looking for common ground, a reason mm -hmm. to be together? Well, that that's that's my concept of power brokering. Mm -hmm. Who are you gonna broker through and with? Mm -hmm. And if you're not conscious of that, then it's not really power brokering anymore. It turns out to be more religious and politics mm -hmm. because that's what that is. That's, mm -hmm. It seems like power. It's like say, I'm a politician, but you have no financial base. You work in politics because mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. is only power if you have the economic backing behind it to make it power. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to have that, we have to have solidarity. It's like people say, he the plug, but the plug ain't greater than the people. Because we outnumber the plu. So the people are greater. Mm. So uh, mm. we can override that whole, that street concept. Yeah, he the plu. Well, he ain't greater than the people. Because without the people, he can't move. But the mm. people collectively can take that spot. The quote unquote mm. plug spot co collectively. So we mm. got to work collectively and get over. You got to get over what slavery has done to us. And you can't ignore it. If you don't know your enemy, you won't fight him. Because you don't think he's real. 
Mm. <laughs> now, anyway, very, very interesting. You don't believe he's there, so you ain't gonna try, man. You ain't gonna convince me of that. Ain't no enemy out there. You don't believe that? Then look at what happened in in Texas. That's straight mm. the money. If you don't believe that's real, then that's why we don't prepare. You got to prepare for battle, war, the won or lost before they ever fall. So mm. we got to lay down foundations right now to expect what could possibly be. It's like chess. That's why I teach chess. It's about mm -hmm. probabilities and possibility. Mm -hmm. And you, you design mm -hmm. your defense that way. So, brother, that's that's what I think about when people say, man, you're power brokering in the black community. Well, if all the things you have, religion and politics, does not draw solidarity into a reality, what's the use of it? Mm -hmm. Muslim, Christian, Hebrew, mm -hmm. Israelite can't come together. And I always tell them, just give me the address of where y'all put y'all money together, and I'll drive to the building that says y'all have solidarity. Yeah, but if you I always, I always that, have you, you having conversation, nice conversation, yeah. man. Lovely, but <clears> give me the address. You ain't got to tell me nothing. I can drive over to that building where y'all sat down, and put your money together, and bought that building. Now it's our building, we do things in it. It's ours as a collective. We set our religions aside. So if your religion don't do that, then what, why, what is your religion for? We can't have power without solidarity. Right, without a doubt. And I, and I always like when you speak on the unity aspect. I've been in many cities on the unity aspect, and it's very powerful and clear. You know, uh, you know, show me where y'all are doing something. At. You know, because I was just writing down something. We uh, uh, and I, the power is being trapped. You know, in these religious ideologies. And it's being trapped in the appropriation of our political of, of our politicians. You know what I'm saying? So we got a lot of power trapped in that that got to be unlocked. And they're gonna take the uh, political maturity and the uh, the removal of capitulated leadership. However, we look at it, even if we're looking at it in the home, you know, the surrendered capitulated leadership that exists in our homes. We talking about the black community, and we ain't talking about no black community if we're not talking about the home. You know. We're uh, replugging the manhood in the homes, you know what I'm saying, and uh, you know different things like that, and then rehashing out, you know, what a religion for Black people re should really look like. You know, uh, just had critical conversations with a young man that had a problem uh, with our center in cold water, saying what it said, Bob, saying New Direction Cultural Center, and a brother felt like, you know, he was he was compelled to uh, approach somebody and tell him. Uh, to tell Patrick, I need to talk to him about, you know, that center. It offended him. And that was that was amazing to me. This was a young brother. But what I'm saying is that we have to unlock, you know, the power that's locked up into these uh, multifaceted things in the black community. You know, we got to have a serious conversation. And I think, you know, what we do doing with Mystic on the Move is, be, is, is really flushing this conversation out. You know, and that's what we want to do with this broadcast. Is to flush out that conversation, you know, and talk about it. Get clear understanding. I see a lot of people, uh, I see a lot of comments that's coming up in the, in the, in the only comment that we need to talk about. Uh, Brother Simbo, what was that? Put that, uh, that, that, uh, that comment he made concerning a sellout. Yeah. He said selling out is a type of brokering. Uh, put it back up there. Where it go? He said selling out is a type of brokering. He said, mostly losing, it, it, it's mostly losing some type of power for a personal gain rather than the collective gain. I think that's what you're speaking to as well, uh, Baba uh, Q-Trail. Uh, but yes, sir, uh, we're looking back at you, uh, Baba Kamal. I see you got something brewing up there. Well, well you know, and, and I, I totally agree uh, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Futrell and, and and yourself. And while you all were talking, I was talking about power brokering and how this society is so quick to ride our back and give us nothing for it. And I'm going to use an example. Take with Juneteenth and the whole Juneteenth celebration. And Walmart has jumped in there and has commercialized Juneteenth uh, for its own financial benefit. Apple is is running a red, black, and green uh phone watch you know and it's just so inexcusable because our capitulated leadership lets this happen you know 
You can come in and you can ride us like a saddle horse, pay no costs or have no respect, but yet you can take our culture. See, uh, other people are manipulating us because they love our culture more than we do. They take our music, they scandalize our women, they and and and, and they've always have done this, you know. And when we talk about power brokering, I gotta agree with the Baba Quasi of what he said. The, the only type of brokering going on is you give me something and I'll relinquish my position or I'll do what you say uh, for a few trinkets or whatever. And this is the whole thing. That's a disillusion. The whole uh, entire movements all the way going through uh, uh, the 60s all the way up until now. And mm -hmm. so this revitalization is, is, is very, very wow. important. But also adding to that, our young people want us to show them how to do, okay? So I would say the power broker would be the teacher. The power broker would be the one that's teaching the carpenter, the electrician, how to go and work for themselves. The power broker would be the one uh, demonstrating and showing how we can create more businesses that could tell the difference between uh, 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 wasting your money on something that doesn't matter and that, that has intrinsic value you know, and, and being able to, to, to do that. And how we broke a power is through the knowledge of what to do. And then once we learn what to do, then taking and making that lot knowledge applicable, applying that knowledge and, and mm -hmm. make it manifest into community. Mm -hmm. So, no doubt. And, and I agree, you know, create the vision, make it desirable for our people to want to make it. So that's the echo. What that brother just said, that's the whole echo of what young people are saying now that age group 18 to 35. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, check this out, because we're going to transition the conversation in a second, you know, to the second part of that, because I think it's going to make second part of the topic tonight is what uh, is the quality of black life? Because it's going to make relevant the first part of what we're talking about. You know what I'm saying? Kind of like reading a book backwards. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to bring it back because we have to say something profound to justify, you know, this right here and what is the quality of black life. Because power, uh, and I put that up there, what, what Jahi said, he said power is the ability to start something and have the ability to stop it at any time. Now, <clears throat> I see what Jahi is saying. And we have had thorough conversations about what he just said. And what he's saying is an aspect of power, which is control. And what I taught him was that control was having the ability to start something, manipulate it as it go, and stop it whenever you please. Let me say it again. Control is having the ability to start something, manipulate it as it go, and stop it when you please. It does equate to power. So when we look at that, and I thank John Heath for bringing that back to respect. When we look at power and control like that, then you start looking at the black community to see what do we have the power to actually control. So then that's where I want to start pointing at, you know, the leadership aspect. And not only that, the aptitude of the masses. Because at the end of the day, is that not the real, uh, is that not who we really need to be brokering this? You know, it's it, it not the masses of black people who are being affected in Mississippi. Should we not have the power to broker that uh, aspect of our reality? Should we not have that? So then <clears throat> if power is in the unity of our people, and then the unity of our people create the leadership. So what is the quality of black life? You know, how, how is black life? Uh, what, how, how are we looking at black life? You know, do we think it's important enough are we important enough to actually get in, 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 in the trenches with this right here and be hashing out and talking the way that we're talking right now? The quality of black life. Brother, I, you know, I was talking to a, a couple of national black leaders today. One of them asked me, was farming still in? With, with with that kind of capitulation, I would say 
and, and, and those type of people at the helm, we are in a state of crisis. Yes, sir. And you just think about what, I, what, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You know, now you're going to ask, is, is farming still in? So that means that uh, you have no idea about the uh, uh, sustenance, the stability, and what it takes in a nation building dynamic uh, because uh, subconsciously you are a ward of the state, right. ward of the government. Yeah. And a lot of our leadership is like that. Do you know that there was a time, uh, just like Mary McLeod Bethune and uh, 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 Booker T. Washington, others, they didn't have any grants. They, they didn't have any uh, subsidies in order for them to do their program. But nowadays, academia, educated leadership, so-called educated leadership, they won't even do anything or put on a program unless they can get a grant for it. Mm. So mm. we're in a state of crisis. We, we have to reclaim our self-determination. We have mm -hmm. to reclaim our own internal value of our self-worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, no doubt, and, and, and not just here in America. These are this is for our African people all around the world, all around the world. We have lost that the value of self worth, that that grit, that integrity, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. makes you get up and do something, and get up mm -hmm. and get it. And we have to restore that, as I say again, and I, I call that word out again through that therapeutic pluralism, which only comes in our own individual cultural cir circles by talking about uh, where we've been, what we have to do now, and where it is that we got to go. Right. So that's exactly right, uh, Bob Kamal. So I want to take this conversation to Dr. Jeffrey Ryan because my brother, uh, Tahi, Taji Nefer, he just said something. I'm going to put it on the screen right quick. <clears throat> uh, that power comes from the control of resources. Those resources can either uh, can be either material or human, but the control of resources, nonetheless, is the point of origin for power. Now, I'm glad he said that because this is not an immature conversation. This is a very mature conversation that we're working up to the maturity. You know, we starting it out. We laid some foundation things. And we're going to build it up to the maturity. But that brother just jumped all the way to one of the most mature aspects of power. You know, and uh, we can we can start historically, but uh, with that, but I want to start with the conception of my relationship with Dr. Jeff Ryan. And I want you to speak to this because I remember this. Uh, when we began to hash out our relationship, when we began at the conception of our relationship, Dr. Jeff Ryan, uh, we had just began uh, now, we was a couple years into our agriculture initiative, and it's very ironic that uh, Baba Kamal spoke about farming as though it was something uh, in the in the reservoirs of the mind of some of these national people that we've both been talking to, uh, Baba Kamal, about what we're doing in Mississippi. But when I met you, Dr. Jeffrey Ryan, our, our common interest was agriculture, and you had took a group of young men, and I want people to listen to this well, because this is what we're talking about about power building. You had took some acres of land and you grew some cotton. Am I right? All right, I think your mic muted. But this, okay, but, 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 okay yeah, okay, I can hear you now. You had grew some cotton, right? Absolutely. Okay, now the thing was, he didn't just grow the cotton because there's a process to it. You know, how do you create a natural resource uh, and, 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 and take it through a process where we can actually be empowered through that, you know? So speak to that uh, empowering uh, experience you did, you know, okay. uh, with those young men and how that showed them the process of right. a natural resource becoming something that they could utilize to build power. Well, you know, we took the land and we grew cotton on it through some co-ops and some cooperation we grew cotton step by step uh the the uh uh preparing and watching it grow developing watering it making sure that the crops were properly tended to and then we had the cotton gin milled and seeded and then sent for fabrication so it's turning the fabric now the pandemic slowed us down in fact i have one of the shirts in the office today and uh 
we took it into the lab. We looked at the shirt. We washed it. We put it in the cleaners. We saw what the draw up was on it. What do we need to do? We made all the necessary changes to produce a product. Being a mm -hmm. black owned company who owns the land, grow the cotton and have it gin, mill seeded, fabricated into a final product, then made into shirts and pocket square. Well, what I did with the young men, first of all, I made them mm -hmm. owners. Here's what changes the the, the negative culture is what we call negative culture syndrome with our sons. Ownership. This is mine. I, I mean, I have to treat it a certain way. I have to protect everything around it. It started to change their negative thoughts because they had ownership and they could see revenues coming from their hands that they created and developed. This is mine. Uh, so that's what I use for our, our sons and daughters. And, and the brother was so right about the center point of power. Hope is the center point of power because without hope, we're finished anyhow because we're up against so much. So what I try to instill in our son, give them hope. But you get with that, it has to be something realistic. It can't, can't be something that's in the air. That's why we don't get a hold of our youth because we don't give them something that's real. So again, we back to the center. The nucleus of power is building that base. They could see many things from the one thing that they did. So mm -hmm. I always keep that in mind with them. I don't let them get away from that. And here again, the orders are already set in our community. We got organization. When I say organization, I mean gangs. Mm -hmm. Just imagine if we could give them this type of lesson and let them see something real. And listen, I, I was in the life. My folks used to say, all that education you have, you could be making $100,000 a year. And that's a month's pay for me. You can't mm. make that make sense to me. You can't make him make $15,000 a week and tell him to take a $15 an hour job. Mm. It's only, that's a divine intervention that can make him understand that. But ownership and something that's he is, he can make him understand the righteous part of what we're trying to get to our youth. And I'm specific about our youth because without the youth, we're finished anyhow. Mm -hmm. If, we, if mm -hmm. we let them be destroyed, there is no future without the youth. Mm -hmm. There's there's no way around this. So our solidarity, our efforts as elders to come together has to be to empower our sons and daughters to do not only better than us, but differently than us, considering the world that they live in. Because if everybody over 40 die right now, once again, our children are in trouble. What do we leave them? Exactly. What structure exactly. have we left them? If all the 40-year-olds die, what, what happens to them? Doesn't mean they're exactly. not intelligent and all that, but we haven't given them a sound infrastructure to build the next set of uh, generations through the years. So my my goal always is to empower them. At first, they were bucking the cotton thing. I ain't selling. I ain't working in no cotton. Field. I ain't no slave. You're mm -hmm. a slave to something, whether you believe it or not. If I'm gonna be a slave to something, it's gonna be my own vision, my mm -hmm. own dream, and that's uh, that's the power I'm talking about. I see it in them. It empowers me to see it, but if you can't see it, you don't draw any power from it. So what the brother was saying about selling out, that's where that selling out stuff comes in. Because mm -hmm. you don't see any power in the in the tribe you held from, nor the youth. So you sell out. You make mm -hmm. a move that's best for you. Mm -hmm. well, Put a pin in that. Ever, we can ever get there. We should never get there. Well, you're going to make mm -hmm. a move that's best for you. That's not what leaders do. Black leaders, we got to eat last. Stop trying to get to the table first unless you're going to serve. Well, that's not a leader. That's, that's not a leader. That's not a leader. And I just want to put a pin in that because we're going to go about tomorrow. But I want to say this in, in the transition right here. Uh, <clears throat> Memphis uh, barbecue trail to me is nothing more than a congested Mississippi. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it again. Mississippi is a congested Mississippi with no natural resources. I'm going to say that. You know, I experienced it on, on a level myself because we actually did it pragmatically. We took water and we manufactured water out of the aquifers of Mississippi, which is already alkaline. Okay, the groundwater here is pretty much already alkaline. So we took it through a process and we bottled it and I sold it successfully to our people. We took the land that we had and we began to grow and uh, produce agricultural development. And like I tell people all over, all over where we go and we talk about the agricultural initiative. No, I did grow no food. We didn't grow no food, Black Liberation Movement, Freedom Nation. 
See, that's that grand concept that we're talking about. We want to talk about feeding a nation that we should be growing our own food. We have to feed ourselves when we haven't even been successful on small models. So we have to create small models. And what we did with the Black Liberation Movement is went forth and created a, a small model. So I did not feed a nation, but we fed Cold War. All who came, all who came to those uh, farmers markets that we created from our own land and our own inspiration and the pragmatism of the concept of, of what uh, Brother Eric Lyles put up there. Uh, you know, you can't feed the people, you can't lead the people. Well, we took that to task. And we began to grow our own food and we moved in a pragmatic way and it became a reality to me so i know it can be done and i and i dealt with in memphis uh the the, the criminal justice system also before we said wait to bob kamal uh on a on a on a, 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 a age that's above the the age that you dealing with uh barbecue trail and i know what you say to be true i was talking with drug dealers who had been released back into the Memphis community. And you're talking about trying to get men not to uh, become uh, repeat, uh, what they call in criminal, repeat offenders, that's used to making ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a week. And you're trying to get these guys to get a job, you know, and it just ain't working. They have created a reality. They got six and seven children out here, you know, and they trying to uh, live a lifestyle or whatever. But what I'm saying is that you have to present them with something that's comparable and compatible with the lifestyle that they had before they were incarcerated. So how do we do that as a black community and not continue the spiral of the black community? How do we appease young black men, you know, if we don't start looking into resource development? I mean, seriously, resource development is a very powerful thing. And when you did that with the cotton, uh, it was very powerful and for telling because y'all took that cotton to gin and those brothers got an opportunity to see that cotton go from the raw material to actual product that they can put on their back and that they can actually sell. So yeah, we're looking to do that, you know, as well in Mississippi with young men like Eric Lau, young men like uh, Jahi Ashe and my own son, you know, that we're dealing with and young men like Baba Kamal's sons, Yamir and Yusuf, who's building the ranks of the Black Youth Leadership Coalition. Yes, sir, Baba Kamal, we say way into you. Well, I mean, I, I totally agree. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with everything. And, and uh, but we also, you know, in terms of brokering and establishing power, we also have to look at the things that are putting a drain on our community. OK, um, you, we have a one point five trillion dollar economy and we're not benefiting from it at all economically. Uh, there was a study done uh, about uh, faith-based preaching and how in the beginning of our movement and our struggle, churches were preaching liberation. They, they were preaching, let my people go. They were preaching freedom now. But now uh, what has happened, and, and we have to have this discussion, what has happened is faith-based preaching has taken over in a lot of the churches where uh, if you pay God, he will bless you. And then the people are still leaving the church, going back to the same crisis conditions, communities still poor and run down, and uh, white supremacy is still prevailing in the community. Now, and I raise this issue because when we talk about brokering and I and still the brother Quasi, he still resonates in my mind, you know, we have, uh, the indictment is on us to let this go wholesale through the churches, wholesale, hmm. okay? Where we capitulate of just trying to be inclusive, go along to get along and uh, don't wait, uh, or, 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 or you know, if, if you follow all the rules that uh, when you uh, die, it'll be all right. Hmm. So we, you know, 
So we we have to uh, correct these type of philosophies because these type of philosophies made that same brother come up to you and tell you something's wrong with your center up there in cold water. Because what it's doing, it's that same type of philosophy that uh, when we have a black power conference that the woman gets afraid and she takes her children out and she says, we don't need black power. We need God's power, not realizing that it's all the same. Hmm. 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 So, so with that, I yield. But when we talk about brokering or being able to broker or one day being able to broker, we also have to look at the things that are preventing us from brokering. Now I'm talking about in the positive way, not the negative way. Of, of brokering, brokering for the collective of our people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, without a doubt, but I appreciate that. And one thing that reflects <clears throat> in my mind, because when I created this topic, I was thinking about some specific things that I had experienced, uh, and I thought it'd be good for conversation. And the things that you know I have experienced that have been affecting me mostly is Mississippi on the move and. As we go into these townships, Dr. Jeffrey Ryan, I think you've been kind of paying attention to what we've been doing, uh, going into these historically black townships in Mississippi, you know, and uh, getting, you know, what we consider to be our leaders, you know, out front, you know, and uh, and, and speaking to uh, uh, our people, the mass, I call it the, ma the, the classes speaking to the masses, and then we have to have something to moderate in there. We have to broker that. You know, we broker in that set, you know, uh by the law as you moderate, you know, so profoundly, you broker in that set. So what I'm saying is that when I'm listening to some of these responses to these critical questions that are being posed to the leaders in our community, you know, and you know, the historic leaders in our community, we got preachers, we got politicians. One very profound thing that was uh brought up in the last town talk. Uh, by Baba D. Bear, who I also tried to have on this call, who's been traveling with Mississippi on the move. He brought up a very interesting fact. It was a fact. He said for the last 20 years, I think it's been over $421 billion collected by churches in the black community. $421 billion in the black community. And I always like to give people a perspective on how much a billion is. And I'm going to give one example of what a billion is. A billion seconds ago, a billion seconds ago was 33 years ago. That's one billion. Okay. So that means if a man was born uh, and he started spending a dollar every second, it would take him 33 years to go broke if he was born a billionaire. So we got $421 billion the black churches have collected in the black community, in the name of tithing, okay? In the name of tithing, okay? That is very inconsequential. You talk about power brokering here. I, I I wish I had been there. It was very, in, it's very inconsequential to the progress of black people here because you sold on the idea that you're doing this for the pearly gates or whatever it is, you know? That's that's, 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 that's that's really something to really contend with. But what happened in that setting, it had the, the largest, uh, the preacher, the, 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 the pastor of the largest con con black congregation in Clarksdale, I think, was on the panel. And it was interesting, interesting to me how he responded to that, uh, that, that, that fact that Baba D. Berry put out there. What the, what the preacher said he began to talk about his church and what his church was doing, you know, and it became deflecting to, and, and couldn't nobody really respond to it because what he began to do is talk about his church. And what I would have told him is that, well, I don't know how much <clears throat> sarcastically your church actually account for $421 billion, sir. I don't know how much your one church in Clarkdale, Mississippi actually account for $421 billion, but it was a general question based on the misappropriation of funds of black churches. So we able to allow, and he deflected another thing when we talked about white terrorism on the black community. And he do the, the, the same deflection everybody else do. They can't deal with white supremacy. 
they basically say, well, we got to stop killing each other. Well, if that was the question, then that would be relevant. But then with the question, we were asking you, sir, what do we do about white terrorism on the black community? And you deflected. And so what I'm saying in saying this is talking about the capitulated leadership again, you know, and where we at with that and where the real power brokers going to emerge. And I think I was thinking in uh, creating this conversation tonight is where the masses of black people begin to mature politically, you know, and gain the uh, the fortitude, the courage to be able to speak truth to power right here in our own community to the sellout capitulated leadership that's going down in Mississippi that I see all over. And I'm saying Mississippi, but this exists all over Black America. It exists all over Black America. I'm just concerned with what I'm going to try and be most effective with and what it is that we're doing right here in Mississippi. And I think every Black person that's concerned about the future of them children that you're talking about, uh, Barbecue Trail, you know, if we're concerned, you know, we should be taking a more mature and serious look at power brokering in the Black community and who hand that's going to land in in the future. So I just left that comment there. I'm pretty sure y'all got something to say. I'm not asking the question. I just left it there. Well, I, I, brother, I think you're right on point. I mean, you center focus on our youth, and that's just, I just, we're just not focused enough on them. I mean, when you talk about the transfer of power, I think that's really the truest form of reparation is the transfer of knowledge and power. The knowledge brings you the power because uh, what the brother said, be it land, cash, silver, or gold, none of that will restore the damage that was done to our soul. Mm. I mean, when we talk about reparation, it has to be included the transfer of knowledge. It's the transfer of power. So we need what what power are we going to transfer to the next generation? And how do mm. we do that in such a way that they can build upon it? Our kids always have to start over. Our youth always have to start over because mm -hmm. we still have yet to lay down the foundation. And mm -hmm. we have positions, but positions don't guarantee power. We have mm -hmm. all the positions here in Memphis. Our people hold all the power, quote unquote, power position, but we, we don't, they got position, but we don't well, have not only that. Not only that, stop right there. <laughs> Bob Kamal, speak to the fact that Mississippi has the most black elected officials to inconsequential yeah. ends. Speak to that. Thank yeah. you, uh, Jeff Ryan. Yeah, um, the state of Mississippi has the most black elected officials in the United States of America, but yet the poorest state in the union and the black poor struggle the most. And so this is why we're having this conversation uh, about Black Power, Mississippi on the move. We have to confront these things, identify them in order to correct them, you know? And so, but we have to make application in terms of what we're talking about, not just conceptualizing. We are talking about doing and, mm -hmm. and, and including people in doing, okay? For too long, there's been too much conceptualization among the leadership. You know, we were just happy just to put a black face on it. We were so downtrodden and so terrorized uh, 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 from Reconstruction through Jim Crow, uh, the terrorism of 1875 all the way through the 60s, all the way up to now. We were, and then with, with the elation of black power, but it went to us being content. We put a black face on it and we went and sat down. We had ignorant electors and uh, ignorant electorate not knowing the issues and not knowing what would be beneficial to a community and not knowing when your leadership is capitulating. Mm -hmm. So we have to correct mm -hmm. this and we have to right. call them out. We have to say, brother, sister, you, you cannot represent us anymore in a coon type way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to mm -hmm. have to sit down and replace these people with those who would be concerned about the health, the welfare, sociological, psychological, biological interests of mm -hmm. the African community. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and we and we got to do not tomorrow. We got to do this now. You know, mm-hmm. now we're in a mm-hmm. crisis situation, mm-hmm. and the economic. You know, we've become such wards of the state until we don't realize the economic crisis that is looming for all of America. Now, uh, poor black, we've always been an economic crisis, but I'm talking about the entire America and how it's going to affect us in a greater way. What we're on the cusp of is there's such a thing called replacement theory. Replacement theory has always occurred with white people and poor black people when white people start getting poor. When white people start getting poor, replacement theory makes white people attack black people. They did it in Tulsa. They did it in Rosewood. They did it in Elaine, Arkansas. The list goes on and on. Did it in St. Louis. You know, uh, they did it in Buffalo, New York. I mean, and and individually and collectively, it, it is a... Uh, it, it, it is a concept that happens and occurs because replacement theory makes these individuals feel like you're going to replace them in American society and get rid of their white supremacy. They feel threatened. This is why you hear these clarion calls. Let's make America great again, again. Mm-hmm. See, that's replacement mm-hmm. theory. Okay. This replacement theory has echoed so long until now you have these second generational replacement theorists, uh, writing manifestos, even now as we speak, and there's some more out there contemplating some more mass shootings. One of mm-hmm. one of the questions that was brought out, uh, you know, if we stop killing each other, which we should, but is that going to make white people stop killing us? <laughs> <laughs> Of course not. Of okay. course not. And, and and so that redeflected, you know, it's real easy to say, well, we need to stop killing each other. Don't, you know, if we stop killing each other, they'll stop killing us. That's wrong answer. Because that's not in 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 actuality, that's not what's going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and so we got to take the blinders off. And we it is what it is. And 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 as brother said come together in solidarity and uh, uh, come to the knowledge of ourself in the full circle of our heritage and culture that our children will know who they are even before they leave out the door. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, Bala Kamal. And as we begin to wind down this conversation, and I think it has been a very thorough and robust conversation, uh, I want to close out on some very uh, powerful points. And you just made one, uh, Bob Kamal, you know, and Sister Crystal had put up uh, put up a, a comment that we should look at. She said, the trending concept is financial literacy. Without understanding the basis of wealth building, without understanding the basis of wealth building is ownership of land and resources. So we can we getting duped into this understanding of financial literacy without understanding the importance of land and resources. The basis, the basis of wealth. See, we out here competing for income. We ain't, we ain't, we ain't even looking for ownership. You know, in capitalist society, you don't own nothing. You ain't nothing. I almost said you ain't shit. <laughs> I, I am gonna say you ain't shit. You know, in a capitalist society, you don't own nothing. You know what I'm saying? So our mind has to be configured to own something. Kind of like what I was telling my uh, son. I control something. And you can't control nothing if you don't own it. So kind of like I was telling my son, we under the concept that money is power. And to a very degree, it is power to a degree. But it's not power absolute. And the way I explained to him, he's a 100-meter champion. Uh, I said, uh, Ahmad, I said, you can run faster than most white people. Probably you know, probably every white person you come up again, you can run faster than them, right? He said, yeah. I said, that's money. I said, power is when they got the ability to keep pushing the line back. See, that's power. So no matter how fast you can run, our money you can get. If you're not able to control the rules, the regulations, the guidelines, your territory, you can exhaust that money. I'm in the trucking business now. I'm seeing exactly how political the trucking business is. 
They just took the gas prices up, the diesel prices up, and the freight prices down. That's a death knell for owner operators. And since it's been an influx of black ownership coming into the trucking business, where a lot of large white fleets are losing their labor because black drivers are seeking to become their own bosses. So now it's a political thing because the transition of the labor has shifted. Laborers are becoming owners. And that's why I hate when they when they when they start talking about poor people not synonymous with black people. You, you're really talking about black people because that's how white people see it. So when they see this labor, it's shifting into the ownership. Now the politics of the game change. And I'm seeing it all the time. I just left Knoxville, Tennessee, drove all the way back, and I'm looking at trucks the whole time. Because I'm in the game now. I'm in this game. So I'm seeing the DOT pulling over all independent operated trucks. I didn't see J.B. Hunt pulled over one time, Bob Future. I didn't see MS Carrier pulled over one time. I didn't see Schneider pulled over one time. All of these were owner operated that were pulled over. So what they're telling me, the power that had been created over the years, the collective white power is basically saying, these niggas want to become owners. We ain't having that. The prices of uh, the components that it takes to run, the truck and the trailer, have gone up three times as much. You get a, a truck now that will cost you $40,000, cost you $120,000 to get that same truck right now. The trailer that you're pulling with, they give you autonomy. It gives you the ability to go somewhere and you don't have to wait on your white boss to tell you when you can get something else because you got his trailer. You got your own trailer. So then you can book your own load and bring your ass on back to where you're going. You see what I'm saying? So I'm looking at the politics of it shifting and moving, you know, and, and it's shifting for a reason. It's to squeeze black people back out of leadership and power positions in an industry that's worth $792 billion a year in this country. It's the backbone. So I'm glad to be in and I'm glad to fight. And I'm looking to unionize our brother along these lines. I mean, I mean, I'm glad to be in. So along with that, I also wanted to say this right here because it, it, it pricked my soul and it pricked my spirit. And I woke up with this uh, in mind uh, just the other morning. <clears throat> that, that question when the preacher uh, responded to the terrorism of white America on black people and the preacher deflected and said, well, we got to stop killing each other. You didn't ask the question. I don't care if you are a preacher. You didn't ask the goddamn question. We asked you. What 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 are we gonna do about white terrorism on the black community? Don't if I wanted you to talk about black on black crime or uh, black on black killing, I would have said that. We would have said that. We didn't say that. But see, that's become acceptable in the black community. That when we talk about white supremacy and white terrorism on black community, and we talking to these black leaders who supposed to give us a, a answer and a response to white uh, uh, terrorism, they don't do it. They deflect. That's cowardly to me. So. I want to tell everybody that's viewing why white people kill black people. It's three reasons that I have deduced that white people kill black people. And the first one is that it's their nature. Simple as that. It's their nature. The second one is because they want to. How about that? They want to. And the third one is that they can. They can. Okay? Why you say that, Lumumba? Is their nature? That's their biological, uh, anatomical makeup. That's what they do. That's how they. That's their nature. Well, what you mean? They want to. Well, that's their psychological uh, situation. And they can. They have the power to politicize. When the when the killer, when Dylan Roof walked into the church, and he killed some very uh influential black people when Dylan Roof walked into that church in South Carolina. Look who he killed. He killed preacher. He killed state representatives. Cause we let him walk in there. Knowing that was out of line, out of place, but we let him walk in there. Okay? Look at the black people he killed. Very influential black people. See that's the capitulated leadership that don't have a proper assessment of white supremacy. You let a white man walk in here and kill nine of y'all. And then he was supposed to be in there. Look at, look at, look at, uh, and then he got escorted away. This is why I said because they can't. He got escorted away without being killed himself. 
this had become copycat. The 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 uh the crocker that went up there and killed up there in Buffalo. That's why I said they want to kill us. And they can. So what I'm talking about, the fortitude about with us and our leadership, where are we gonna get the moral character to stand up for our own humanity? You know, to what is the quality of black life to us? When are you gonna stop? When are we gonna stop accepting these bullshit ass leaders? You understand what I'm saying? Real talk. I don't care nothing about you being a pastor, none of this shit. That don't matter to me. You know, I'm talking about when are you gonna stop allowing people to be scorned and ridiculed and stand up for your own humanity. So that's what's going on. White people kill us because they want to and they can't. And until we develop the moral character to stand up for our own humanity. They're going to continue to do it. And I got a fourth reason. The fourth reason is that our genes are dominant. They're recessive. If we go into one of them and have a baby, the baby becomes one of us. If they mm -hmm. go into one of us and have a baby, the baby still is one of us. In order mm -hmm. for them to produce themselves, they have to go into each other. Therefore, there is a fear. And, 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 it has always been said a scared man will kill you quicker than one that is not. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of us and afraid of what we can do just by our presence because we're melanated people. And because we're melanated people, uh, they fear uh, that if they keep going into us, that they will become annihilated. And so they result to what they know. I saw it on screen. They ice people. Yes, they are. We're sun people and they're ice people. And so uh, in their nature, uh, that's what they, you know, that's what they do. That's their reaction to pick up the spear or the sword or the gun, because you do know that war is politics that it went real bad and they practice that all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 the other interesting thing that I want to say, and then I'll be quiet, is is, is that uh, I was listening to Professor James Smalls, and he was talking about the African warrior, the beginning of the African warrior, was just a myth. It was created by them as an excuse to attack us. It was created by them. We were aggregarian people from societies that, uh, farm. We were peaceful people until we met invaders. And ever since we met them, they've always tried to frame the narrative of who we are, what we are, what we do, what we say. And so the, the actual warrior, that wasn't, we were intellects, we were intelligent, we were uh, 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 healers and academic and peaceful people, okay? but coming in contact with them not saying that we won't fight if we if we weren't attacked but we were developed into that that's not in our nature our nature by nature we're righteous mm. <clears throat> very interesting and uh i think what you were speaking to you know in that fourth uh cause of the killing of white people i because i don't give a damn cause i i mean seriously we 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 should be responsive to that. I mean, responding to that with with, with some of that. I, I mean, I don't know how you, you stop that shit. But what I'm saying is that that's white genetic annihilation and the recessive will always seek to destroy the dominant if it means for their survival. So, you know, no doubt. And I appreciate that spiel, uh, Baba Kamal. And I'm so grateful to have you uh, as counsel to this movement. Uh, Dr. Futrell, we're getting ready to close it out. You have some closing thoughts for us? Well, uh, about just stepping back to agriculture, I don't think there is culture without agriculture. So for the folks who want to know if, if farming is still a lot, uh, <laughs> there is no culture without agriculture because mm -hmm. everything is developed from the earth. So I think we need to definitely stay focused on on agriculture, feeding ourselves. Mm -hmm. we're, those, we're that group of men who rely on other men to feed our families. We've got to change that dynamic. All right. Well... With that being said, uh, Baba Kamal, Baba uh, Futrell, thank you all for coming on tonight. Thank you for having me. Very, you. very, very profound. And I really appreciate your friendship. I appreciate your guidance. And I appreciate the fact that we warriors in the same cause. You know, yes. uh, 
I'm gonna leave with uh, a common thought that I always like to part conversations and events with because I like to leave it on our people's brain. <clears throat> Baba Kamal, uh, not Baba Kamal, Baba Chabaka Africa said, he said that the people would be annihilated, killed, marginalized, and I mean annihilated, discriminated against, marginalized, and even killed until they develop the moral character to stand up for their own humanity. So with that I'm being sure. said, let's uh we'll uh be back this time next week at seven o'clock. Unless we feel that something very important needs to be talked about, we'll come whenever we come. But the scheduled time is Thursday night at seven o'clock. We appreciate everybody for coming on tonight and giving their input. And uh we'll see you next Thank time. You Subscribe to the YouTube. Subscribe to the YouTube and uh share this broadcast. Thank you all. Hotel. See you next week. Thank you.